guys, welcome back. In our last video notes, we spent a lot of time talking about how our early human ancestors adapted to a changing environment and how we migrated or moved from place to place in search of things like food, water, shelter, all of that. And some of the inventions that we came up with that allowed us to live a little bit of an easier life. Today, though, we're going to see one of the biggest changes in human history, the agricultural revolution. This is just a big fancy word for when we figured out how to farm. And that meant that we can stop moving around from place to place and stay in one place and really build up cities and all sorts of things. I can't wait to show you how that happens. So our era that we're going to be talking about is our Neolithic era. Now remember in Paleolithic, that was the Old Stone Age. This is our Neo for new. Go ahead and circle and write that word new in. And lithic, again, means stone. And if you get Paleolithic and Neolithic confused, just remember that in in Neo is just like the in in new. And this is a period of time when we've developed beyond just our migrating in from place to place. But it began about 8,000 BC and lasted until about 4,000 BC. So we're looking at a period of about 4,000 years. And, and we'll see that it comes to an end when we develop tools that don't need to be made from stone anymore. Now, gradually, we talked about the ice ages last time, gradually the climate starts warming. And people, of course, want to move into an area that has a mild climate. So we start moving into an area that has mild climate and fertile land. It means it's good for growing crops. And humans start to develop agriculture or farming and domestication or taming animals for human use. We realize when we stay in one place that the seeds that we toss away from gathering can be um, gathered again because they regrow. And if we stay in one place, we can grow them year after year. So here, for example, is, an, is a grain of wheat. Wild wheat, all the way over here, is just a very small, small grain. But over time, humans realized that if they picked from the biggest grains, because those are the ones you want to eat, and they replanted the seeds that were left over, over a long period of time, and you keep choosing the biggest ones, keep choosing the biggest ones, keep choosing the biggest ones, you can change or domesticate your crops to be a lot more useful for humans. This is the same thing we did with animals as well, whether it was taking a wild boar and taming it to um, be a wild pig, things like horses, um, cows for dairy milk, and breeding them so that over periods of time, we can have the ones that are most useful for humans. This allowed us to be able to settle down and have a constant food supply. And this creates a surplus or more than is needed. This is a super important vocabulary word here, guys, surplus. Please circle that word. A surplus, we have plus, we have more than enough. And that means we can put some in storage and save it for later. So during this period of time, we start to see evidence of actual villages with stone walls and little huts and areas with crops marked out and areas where we can keep the, plant, the uh, domesticated animals. And because of all of this, the healthier food or more food rather, um, we have population growth. So that's kind of the big overarching theme. And this map shows us by about 5,000 BC, all of these red areas had agriculture in these little independent areas and over here in North and South America too. And then by about 3,000 BC, all the areas with yellow had it. And then by about 2,000 to 1,000 B or 500 BC, all of these areas had it as well. I want you to take a look at this Neolithic village that we see right here. Notice that we've got farmland out here, all sorts of houses and everything in here, and then there's a wall around the village. 
Why do you think once we as humans had settled down into our farming villages that we might choose to surround those villages by thick walls? What is it about living in one place that requires us to be more protected? And when you take a look at this map, you can see again some of those different areas all over the world where agriculture developed independently. And we see this same village type everywhere with the big thick walls, all the people living in an area, and the farming outside. So take a moment and tell me why that might be the case. Now, the Neolithic Age comes to an end because people start to discover how to work with metal, including copper. So copper is a very soft metal. It's beautiful, but the drawback is it doesn't hold a good sharp edge and it dulls easily. So craft people in Western Asia, what we call today the Middle East, discovered that mixing copper and another metal called tin created bronze, which was stronger than copper. And it became widely used between about 3000 and 1200 BC. And this is known as the Bronze Age. And I want you to circle that this is the end of the Neolithic Age. You should know that the use of metal tools and figuring out how to work with metal ended the Neolithic Age. And we never could have done that if we hadn't been able to settle down, grow crops, specialize because we have a surplus more than we need, and then kind of have the time to experiment and figure out how to work with metal. Now let's talk a little bit more about that life in the Neolithic Age. We had a steady food supply. We had more than enough grain. We might not have had as much of a variety as we had during the Paleolithic when we were moving around from place to place, but we could store it and be consistent with it. Because we had more nutrition and more food available, we could feed more people. There was more food to go around. You didn't have to worry about which kid you're going to feed today. We can feed more of them because we had the food. So we had a growing population. More food is produced than can be eaten, so we can store it. This is a really cool ancient grain storage silo. And so we can start to specialize. And that means that not everybody has to grow food. You can decide, you know what? I'm going to take the grain and I'm going to be the baker and I'm going to do that all day. And I will sell my food or trade, trade the bread I bake for the food that I need to survive. You could also be a potter, or maybe you were going to be the best blacksmith that you could be. So by having this steady food supply, we are able to grow and grow. Now we're gonna see this chart again. So I want you to put a big star, actually, you know what, not just a star, I want you to circle this chart. It is so, so important, ladies and gentlemen. Please be sure that you have this um, idea narrowed down. We have our food, our population grows up, and the more people that we have means the more people can grow food, and then we can specialize. We can, we don't all have to be farmers. You could be a soldier, I could be a baker. We have, we'll need some farmers, of course, but we can all start working a variety of different jobs. When we talk about civilization, it's kind of a funny term because it means more than just small villages, people just kind of barely getting by. And it doesn't matter whether the civilization was in France or in Egypt or in South America or Asia, there are some characteristics that each civilization has in common. So we're gonna take a moment to look at some of those characteristics. Fill in the blanks in the bubble and then draw a picture representing the concept outside of the bubble. So no matter where the civilization is, one characteristic that a civilization has to have is cities and government. We have to have a way of organizing people together. Okay, so we need to have some sort of person at the top giving orders and helping everybody stay organized down below. A civilization also has to have some sort of religious belief. Um, it could be one god, it could be many gods. But when we see a civilization, that's one of the characteristics that we expect to see. We also expect to see some sort of social structure. Now, we didn't have that in the Paleolithic, but in the Neolithic, and when we are looking at our 
um, Bronze Age, it often looks a little bit like this, like a triangle. And at the very top, we have the most powerful, and there's only a couple people up there, maybe the king, maybe the chief, whoever it might be. And then down at the bottom is the majority of people. So this section's bigger, but it also has less power down at the bottom. And how it's divided in between might be different from place to place, but in a civilization, there's somebody in charge and there's somebody at the bottom. It's not like in our small Paleolithic groups, <clears throat> pardon me, where it's just a few people and they're all kind of on the same level. We start to see different people rising to the top or sinking to the bottom. We also see writing and art. Now, <clears throat> There are some civilizations we haven't figured out their writing style yet or what their writing means, but most historians agree that in order for a civilization to be considered a true civilization, they need writing and art. Now, on your video notes, please make sure that you draw in for each bubble that you filled in the blanks and you've drawn just a small symbol to represent those things, okay? now. Please double check, make sure all of your notes are accurate. I should see no blanks anywhere. Make sure your hot question is answered in full sentences. Remember that you do lose points for not following directions this way, guys. All right, I love you, have a great week, make good choices, and I will see you soon, bye.